Now, my next guest here on day one of the Gold Summit needs no introduction. It's Nigel Farage. While a lot of people think of him simply as a political firebrand, he actually has a very long history with metals in general, and indeed with precious metals like gold and silver. And I wanted to ask him about that. Uh, I also wanted to ask him specifically about gold's role as an asset in an era of declining trust, declining trust in society, in institutions, in governance, and how that fits into what he's seeing on the political stage today. I hope you enjoyed. Nigel, welcome to the Gold Summit. Thank you so much for joining me. No, not at all. And I've been fascinated by precious metals for my entire life. Yeah, let's get into that because, you know, Nigel, your background as a metals trader, as a metals broker at the London Metals Exchange, I don't think it gets really quite so much of the so much attention as I think it should. Could you let me know, like, you know, just what it was like back in uh, back in the olden days when you were when you were trading metals on the ring, what the manner in which precious metals were viewed by uh, traders and brokers there? Because while gold isn't traded on the London Metals Exchange, I mean, you guys must have been very aware of it and focused on it uh, while you were trading all of the others, right? Yeah, I mean, my first brush with precious metals was in about early 1980, when at school, I'd set up an investment society. Uh, and we bought one or two stocks and shares. Uh, and then we got this idea, we wanted to buy physical silver. So we did, we bought some physical silver. Um, and of course, we got lucky, because that was the great silver boom. Now we didn't get out. We didn't get out anywhere near the top. Um, but but it was a great introduction to metals trading and to precious metals. And when it came to leaving school, um, well, you know, I was expected to go to university, but I decided, no, I'm not going to. Um, I looked at the stock exchange, because my father was a stockbroker, and his father before him was a stockbroker, but something about commodities, something about metals, just, I don't know what it was, but it appealed to me. So aged 18, I went straight into work for a company on the London Metal Exchange, um, a firm that had been around since the 19th century, but had recently been bought by Drexel Burnham Lambert of Wall Street fame or infamy, depending how you view it. So the metal exchange was there predominantly for base metals. We traded copper, aluminium, lead, tin, zinc, and nickel. But when I went there, there was also a silver contract. One lot of silver was 10,000 ounces. So we did actively trade silver on the exchange. And back then, there was even something called the LGFM, the London Gold Futures Market, which wasn't a success because gold, you know, was, was, was traded and the daily price was set at the daily gold fix by a handful of the big gold houses. So silver was part of what we did every day, uh, but gold was something, of course, that we were acutely aware of. Now, we had this big precious metals boom in 1881, especially in silver, the Nelson Bunker Hunt squeeze, which of course in the end, as with all squeezes, ended and ended very abruptly. Um, and through those early years, in the 1980s, the arguments against gold were very, very strong. The arguments, of course, were that interest rates spent much of that period in double digits. And of course, if you own gold, you don't earn interest on the money. And if you own physical gold, you have to pay a bit of money to store it. And gold became very, very unfashionable. You know, um, inflation, inflation after about 82, inflation, which had been very high for the previous decade. One of the reasons that gold did have big moves up was that it was seen as a store, a value of wealth. But as we went into a period of relatively high interest rates, but not that higher inflation, gold was seen to be unfashionable. Now, you know, I, I, I understood those arguments, um, but of course they led to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, one Gordon Brown, deciding that gold was a barbarous relic and selling 400 metric tons of it um, at the end of the 1990s. Uh, it turned out to be one of the worst financial decisions any British Chancellor has ever made. Um, historically, look at the gold chart, it's known as the brown bottom. Uh, he sold 400 tons of it um, at about an average of $270 an ounce. Um, truth of it is, truth of it is, uh, that gold is one of those great hedges, one of those great stores of wealth uh, against things going wrong in the financial system. 
And even though it's had its ups and its downs, as all commodities do, the truth of it is that if you go back through the centuries, gold has actually represented a very good investment. So, so yeah, you know, I spent 20 years um, broking and dealing in metals. And although I spent all of my time on base metals and non-ferrous metals, uh, precious metals, always been bow as a big part of my life. You know, could you take us back to that that period uh, when you were uh, trading in the ring? Because you know, these days it does look like uh, the ring, the London Metals uh, sort of red sofa circle, where uh, all of that trading takes place. Uh, it does look like it's on its way out. Ever since the pandemic, it's been sort of uh, vacated, and uh, now the exchanges, uh, London Metals Exchange, is talking about uh, completely phasing it out in favour of uh, electronic uh, dealing and uh, trading only. Uh, could you take us back to what it what it was like then, and the manner in which like uh, precious metals were viewed? You said earlier there was the the LGFM, the London uh, Gold Futures mm. Market, uh, which didn't quite work out. Could you expand a bit on uh, on how that didn't work out? Was it just because the uh, the bullion fix wasn't quite uh, it, well? The the uh, the futures market for gold was uh, you know more in places like the U.S. Uh, and they they stole mo- much of that business, or was it because more due to the the influence of the bullion banks here in London? You know, the whole point of open outcry trading uh, and, and the way that it first came about um, was number one, as a means to buy and sell metal. Um, and classically, uh, we would trade three months forward because that was the amount of time it took to get copper out of the ground, smelted and tr- travel across the Atlantic into European warehouses. So, it, you know, there, w- there was a spot dimension to what we did but much of it was forward trading, futures trading, perhaps, as we would now call it. Um, The exchange was there. Open outcry was there as a means to buy and sell, um, as a means for companies to hedge. You know, if you're a miner and you're producing copper, your job is to be good at getting copper out of the ground, not to speculate on the price of copper. So you would sell your forward production at a price, locking in. And similarly, you know, if you're manufacturing washing machines in, in somewhere in the Ruhr, um, you, you know, you want to make sure that an adverse price movement in copper, uh, you know, doesn't, that doesn't badly affect uh, your business, so you hedge your forward consumption on the exchange. But the other point about open outcry is that it was a means of establishing a daily settlement price, an open, transparent, unarguable means of setting a settlement price. And on the basis of the LME settlement price daily, all the physical transactions around the world would be conducted <coughs> at that price. Um, and the way that it worked, to be uninitiated, is at 12.30, a bell would go. And that would be the open outcry daily fixing price for copper, right? And that bell, that trading session, would last for five minutes, right? And it's rather like a horse race. It starts off fairly slowly um, with minor transactions taking place. And then in the last minute, in the last 30 seconds, all hell breaks loose. (laughs) And there are people in the ring screaming and shouting. And it's very, very difficult, you know, to talk to somebody who's even five feet away. And that, of course, is where Tic Tac, you know, it comes in. So, you know, up is bid. So that's one bid. Two offered, one bid, two offered, two trades, two trades, two trades bid, two trades bid, two to three, two to three. So, so a lot of stuff is done by sign language. Um, and sometimes as that last bell approaches, I mean, it, there are days down there. It was absolute bedlam. And to the uninitiated, they think, well, how on earth does any order ever come out of this? How on earth do people agree? And the toughest job, the hardest job, in the whole of the business was to be a clerk. And the clerk would lean behind the trader and have to write down with a pencil and paper everything the dealer had done. And then when the bell went, go around the back and check with the other clerks to agree what had been bought and sold. And uh, the clerks were treated as the lowest of the low and yet actually they had in many ways the toughest job down there. Uh, And there were disputes, there were disputes, but a different age. You know, an age of my word is my bond. And that was drilled into me when I was 18. My word is my bond. We never had lawyers. We never recorded telephone conversations. And if there was a dispute, you know, the traders in dispute would be taken over the road 
to the wine lodge, given a pint of beer, sat in the corner with the arbitrator, um, and they would reach a conclusion of some kind. So a very, very different world. Um, the, the characters uh, that worked on those trading floors were just extraordinary. Um, every, every single class and background you can ever think of. It was very male, um, and some people look at that and criticize it. There were women, I mean, there were successful female traders, <clears throat> but it wasn't an environment that many women really liked very much, for whatever reason. Um, but it was truly, and this is the real point, it was truly international. You know, this wasn't just a sort of city boys luncheon club, although the social elements to life in the city then were pretty enormous. But this was, you know, the phone would ring and you pick it up and, you know, it might be somebody from, from within the UK. It might be somebody ringing from Paris or Frankfurt, but it was more likely to be Singapore or Santiago. And what London did really well with base metals is it established itself as the global center for base metals trading. And whilst there were other attempts by exchanges in Chicago, exchanges in New York, exchanges in the Far East, in those days, London always ruled the roost. And I think one of the reasons for that was the time zone was hugely helpful. There we were in the middle. So, you know, early in the morning, the Aussies would be on the phone. And then by lunchtime, the Americans are coming in. So that put London in a very, very good place. And of course, the language. And I think we often underestimate, um, and it kind of links in to why I believed in Brexit from, 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 from a very early age, is that our language also gives us phenomenal advantages. Now, gold was the poor relation in, in London terms of futures trading. Why? Uh, well, because there was already a successful futures exchange in New York. The COMEX exchange was already doing a lot of volume. <clears throat> and London was dominated, but gold was dominated more by the spot price than it was by the futures price. And that was already in the hands of the big bullion houses. So, you know, I look back on it, um, I must be honest with you, with a degree of nostalgia. Um, it was an enormously fun place to work, a wonderful kaleidoscope of colourful characters, um, a, a genuine feeling that we were at the epicenter of something that was global. And I always found that actually terribly exciting. Um, and of course, you know, a social life, which, well, I'm not sure the British Medical Association would approve um, of the drink culture and all the rest of it. Um, and it might not have been very good for people's health, but gosh, we had a lot of laughs doing it. It does seem like a great shame that uh, the LME physical you know, trading floor uh, does look to be on its way out. But, you know, relating to what you just said there with, uh, you know, an era in which my word was my bond and it was uh, plenty of gentlemen's agreements, uh, which sort of kept everything together. You know, I've been thinking recently about this, the idea, which, you know, it's not my idea, it's been, been around for a very long time, that gold is, a, is an asset that prospers in an environment of declining trust. You know, decline in, institu in, decline in trust in institutions, decline in trust in governments, or even just in, uh, you know, society, a stable society itself. Uh, you know, you've been at the forefront of a lot of the, you know, the, the unrest, well, not the unrest, but the, the, uh, the sense of unease that has dominated British politics uh, for a long time. You know, the every man feels like he's not, uh, you know, he's not, he, you know, things aren't quite right. You know, he's not getting his fair share for what, for, you know, the labor that he puts in. Um, what do you, where do you think that's coming from? Because it feels like gold and what, what is uh, sometimes pejorative, re pejoratively referred to as populism sort of go hand in hand. Like, where do you think that all that, where do you think that comes from? Where do you think that ultimately the problem originally lies? Look, I think, you know, and if we look at the story of Brexit and when historians look back at Brexit in 50, 100 years time, um, it will be seen as a grassroots revolution because that's what it was. It was a grassroots revolution. You know, I got onto this train about 30 years ago and I was astonished that all the political parties, all the national press, all the trade unions, all the big businesses, everybody supported this consensus view that Europe was our future. And if you asked a question, well, what kind of Europe, um, you were told not to worry on your little head, it would all be okay. And whilst there were Eurosceptics, you know, the, you know the, there were people that were critical and questioning of the direction of travel. Uh, you know, UKIP, myself, 
we were the first people really to come along and say, actually, whether we go in this direction quickly, whether we go in this direction slowly, we're actually going in the wrong direction. So a disconnect opened up between what the establishment in London said and what people out in the country thought. And the more education they got, the more they discovered what open borders might mean for the population of the UK, for their ability to get a GP appointment, for compression of their wages, the more people understood what it was costing us in terms of money to be part of it, the more people understood that, you know, in the English Channel, the UK fleet are allowed to catch 7% of the cod and the French 77. The more people understood about this, the less they wanted to be a part of it. And I think in the end, it was a complete breakdown of trust between the center and what was actually happening outside the big metropolis. Um, and that trust in the end, even after the referendum, um, has led to the Labour Party, you know, finding itself just utterly disconnected from millions of its own voters who deserted the party that their grandparents had voted for when they came back in 1918 from the First World War. They deserted a tribal allegiance to the Labour Party. They came to me to begin with, and now they've gone to Boris. So the breakdown in trust has led to dramatic political change. Now, the question is, do people start to lose trust and confidence in government and the way they're dealing with money? Everybody knows that the government is borrowing absolutely up to the kazooks. Increasingly, people are aware uh, of all sorts of financial trickery and money creation and quantitative easing and all the rest of it. And I think the moment that people start to lose trust in what is being done with our money, what we would call, I think, the debasement of currency, the moment that happens, is when we start to see something back in the system that you really need to be my age to even remember, and that is inflation. You know, we've lived now for decades with inflation barely being something that even gets discussed because it's bumped along you know, at relatively low levels. And you start to get inflation pushing up towards double digits, and then what we see you know, is what we saw in the 70s with my grandparents' generation where their life savings are diminishing rapidly with every single year that goes by. Um, and I think, Boaz, that's when the breakdown of confidence in money, the breakdown of confidence in our currencies, that's when it comes. And I think there are some early signs of that. Uh, you know, some of the move into crypto is a little bit like that. Uh, but of course, crypto, for some investors, uh, will view it as being extremely volatile. And some people, are, you know, struggle to understand what it really means and what it really is. Gold, on the other hand, hey, we all know what gold is. We all understand what gold is. Um, and if that breakdown in trust comes, uh, then gold will be the go-to thing to invest in. Right. You know, Nigel, you know, thinking of uh, just how much money the, uh, the government is spending now, and it's all across the developed world, really, in the, uh, the incredible sort of outflow of uh, a paper currency that's coming from national treasure treasuries. It's really quite remarkable just how quickly that's all happened uh, with the coronavirus pandemic more broadly. But, you know, do you think there's, a, there's something of a, a tipping point that's going to be reached here where there'd be any retracement from that? Because... Uh, my, uh, you know, just looking around the, the political spectrum as it is today, there doesn't seem to be any interest whatsoever in austerity from any of the major political forces there are out there. No. Right. I mean, look, this was happening way before, wasn't it? This was happening way before the, the coronavirus pandemic. It happened in the wake of the 2008 um, financial crash. And, and I'd never heard of quantitative easing. I'd never heard of it. <laughs> the idea that government buys its own debt. Um, the, the idea of money creation uh, on this scale is not something I'd ever come across, uh, you know, even thought through, really, despite decades of being involved in some way with financial markets. Um, and look, government has become addicted to this, rather like a drug user. And as you say, there is no political voice no political voice suggesting 
that this might end really rather badly. So we've got that. The other thing we've got going on is this false currency called the euro. And, you know, to merge the north of Europe and the south of Europe together inside a currency, together inside an economic and monetary union, and the idea being that they would all converge and their economies would all become similar. And actually what we're seeing through the coronavirus pandemic is increasing divergence between the north and the south of Europe. And that's another thing to think about. You know, when we talk about trust, uh, you know, at some point in time, I am convinced that this false monetary union is going to lead to some kind of rebellion. It'll come probably from one of the Mediterranean countries. And again, when that happens, when that happens, we're going to see all kinds of pressures on the banking system. You know, we could be headed for something as bad, if not worse, maybe much worse than what happened back in 2008. And again, that would be another huge breakdown in trust, breakdown in confidence. Um, and, and this time it's not about who makes the laws for us as it was over Brexit. This time it's about our money, it's about our savings and what's going to happen to them. Right. You know, going back to, uh, you know, the because quantitative easing, of course, comes from the central banking side. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of rhetoric now and a lot of general policy shifts towards fiscal spending rather than monetary monetary stimulus. Yeah. Um, like, do you think that's going to reach a tipping point at any point? Uh, well, a tipping point at any point. You know, uh, do you think that's going to reach uh, something of a, you know some kind of crescendo where suddenly it re it seems like we're spending too much money? Because despite the huge amount of money that the Treasury has managed to spend this year, it doesn't look like we're uh, we're anywhere close to reaching a level at which uh, there's a, a great pullback from that. No, I mean, look, you know, on the fiscal side of it, um, <laughs> we are going to need quite dramatic and sustained growth within the UK economy um, to start to eat back into these huge sums of money. But I, I'm not sure. I mean, I feel, I do feel that Brexit Britain is relatively in a much better position than France, Germany and Italy. And that I will say. Um, at some point, at some point, you know, if the UK government was to struggle to get its sales of guilt, its sales of government debt away, you know, maybe then that's the moment that, that politically people start asking the questions. But for the moment, for the moment, we're nowhere near that. And it seems to me there are lots of people out there um, who seem to be very happy with being paid to be at home, <laughs> very happy, you know, uh, particularly those in the public sector, that their jobs aren't under threat. Uh, I do think there is a reckoning to come. How it comes, how soon it comes, I just don't know. Well, changing tack slightly, Nigel, because you'll know this very well from uh, your, your metals days. You know, what China does when it comes to commodity consumption is, you know, can be the only thing that matters for certain commodities. And gold is something that China takes a very strong strategic interest in. Like, what do you make of that? What do you think China's grand plan is when it comes to its holdings of bullion? Because, you know, it's the biggest miner of gold in the world, or at least it claims to be, and you can't really sort of check their homework because they don't export any no. of that gold. Uh, but, you know, it encourages its citizens to own gold. Like, what do you think they're, they're really trying to do uh, by incentivizing all of this gold accumulation within their borders? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, this is a separate conversation to the Chinese Communist Party, to the AI kind of world they want us to live in, um, to the Uyghurs. Um, I'm not going to discuss the political aspects of it, but the economic aspects of it are, well, look, the great commodity boom that we saw, the super boom we saw in commodities, you know, from 2004 onwards, um, the driver was China. There's no question. You know, tens of millions of people leaving an and, and agricultural lifestyle to move to the big cities and actually wanting a Western lifestyle. They wanted to have fridges. They wanted to have freezers. They wanted to have all these things uh, that meant a massive spike in demand for commodities. Um, obviously, we know that financially, uh, China, on its current course before very long is going to be the biggest economy in the world and maybe the biggest by quite some margin. And there's a population there of 1.4 billion people. Uh, they're doing their best, of course, with their own internet. They're doing their best uh, with their own version of a sort of digital currency. Um, they're trying to make themselves almost self-sufficient um, in terms of how they run, 
and manage their own country. What I don't know, but what is really interesting, whatever the Chinese central bank decides to do, whatever the Chinese government decides to do when it comes to gold bullion, you know, does gold become the must have accessory for China's rapidly increasing middle classes? Uh, and, and that of course, that of course, if it really was to happen at scale, would make a very, very, it's an if, but if it did happen, uh, that would have a very, very dramatic impact on the price of gold. Yeah, when it comes to the rise of China, because uh, when you're speaking about China becoming the world's largest economy, I mean, the big commodity consumers get to dictate the terms of trade when it comes to uh, you know, the, the main commodities they consume. So like America with oil, uh, well, when America was formerly the largest oil consumer. Uh, do you think uh, when it comes to gold, there's, uh, you know, China, while it restricts its, uh, while it restricts any sales of gold from it, from its borders, doesn't export any. Do you think that might, um, th this sort of uh, monopolization over commodity supply might extend to uh, gold mining in other countries, for example, across the Belt and Road Initiative? It's not impossible. It's not impossible, uh, but it's hard to predict. Um, but all you can say for certain is that China will do whatever it has to do to pursue what it believes to be its own interests. So don't rule anything out. Yeah, looking forward then, Nigel. Uh, so we've spoken about trust, we've spoken about uh, China, um, and sort of the, some of the, a lot of the tensions that have been brewing in, in uh, the developed world over the past, uh, past couple of decades. Like looking forward uh, for gold specifically, and though silver uh, applies to it as well. You know, just looking forward on that, do you have any, um, you know, any sort of broader price predictions for where the price of gold may go in the future? Well, gold has been relatively quiet. Um, you know, over the last period of time, and we're around about the seventeen hundred, seventeen twenty dollars an ounce. Um, we're, you know, we're not that far. We haven't really pulled back that much from the sort of two thousand dollars an ounce highs that we've seen. Yeah, sure, we've been down to fifteen hundred, whatever, and, and, and add a little bit lower. Um, but I think what's interesting about gold over the last few years is that each successive low, when the market's in a bearish frame of mind, each successive low just gets that little bit higher. Um, and you're trading gold again and again and again from a higher base. Um, I, I personally, I personally you know, wouldn't have any kind of long-term, for me, long-term financial management planning without a reasonable percentage of that being in gold, or gold shares. Um, and I think, for me, that's the right place to be. It's exactly where I am. Uh, and it is, as I say, it is really a big, big hedge against something going dramatically wrong in terms of inflation, in terms of the Eurozone, in terms of the risks that we see across many Western world economies. And, you know, if we do get a rally at some point um, in, in the next year or two, and we break those old highs, you know, decisively break those old highs at around about 2000, then it could go up quite a long way. And I'm not gonna put a number on things because I, I, I think, you know, frankly, you, you've got about as much chance of winning with that as you have you know, pinning the tail on the donkey as a kid at a party game. But I do think, look, what I really think is, I really think that Biden is massively overheating the American economy. What I really think is that inflation is coming back. What I really think is that interest rates are going up, which maybe of itself is not a positive for gold, but I really think the gold price will be a lot higher within the next few years. Yep, I believe that. Right, well, just before we, just before we go then, uh, Nigel, because we've not really dwelt so much on, on, on the US uh, in, the, in this conversation, but just on a, part, on a passing sort of note for that. When you're thinking of the Biden administration and its uh, broad spending plans on infrastructure and things like that, I mean, do you think that's, yeah. um, how do you think that's going to be remembered uh, in sort of economic history? Well, look, I mean, you know, if you think the UK government is borrowing and spending large sums of money, if you think European governments are borrowing and spending large sums of money, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because what America is doing is absolutely dwarfing that. Now, they have got a much more robust economy than us. There is perhaps an argument in America that they can get sustained high growth, you know, to bite back into those huge sums. But it literally, what Biden is doing is eye-watering. And I think we've got massive stimulus. This is my view, massive stimulus going into an economy 
that is fundamentally strong, and it was booming, wasn't it? It was booming before the coronavirus pandemic came along. Um, and, and, and I think they're overdoing it. I think they're overcooking it. Uh, I don't feel that, I, you may say it's early days, but I don't feel that his, that his administration is actually in control of anything from their southern border to the way they're handling money. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I believe American overheating is coming and possibly coming quite quickly. Well, Nigel, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Well, there you have it, folks. That was Nigel Farage. Very interesting to look at gold through a political lens and not just through the financial market lens that we normally look at it through. But that is all for today. We shall be back again tomorrow. Hope you tune in there. We've got a lot more guests coming up, and I'm very excited to speak to them.